four, three, two, go sprint, go Ava. There it is, holding. Awesome. That's it. I did it. <laughs> the Straight up. GNSS system. Shoots, shoots. Oh! Beautiful. That is what we call third time's the charm. Hey everyone, my name's Joe Barnard. That was Sprint Flight 8, and here are some stats. The vehicle mass was 860 grams, the apogee 116 meters, the max velocity 24 meters per second, and the motor was an apogee F10. This is the first flight that has flown with AVA and also worked which is to say this is the first successful flight with AVA, and it's a really big deal. AVA is the new flight computer that I've developed to fly everything I build. It literally stands for All Vehicle Avionics. Don't ask any questions about that scorch mark on the computer, by the way. Um, nothing happened there. I'm a really good electrical engineer, and I would never ever make a mistake that led to catastrophic, spontaneous combustion of the fiberglass in the board. So let's talk about what the big deal is here with AVA. Uh, it uses a GNSS radio to steer the rocket downrange. It controls the horizontal position and the velocity of the vehicle. It's really hard to get right, but it worked this time. So let's take a look at some of this footage and see how well it did. It's not going to be perfect. Civilian GPS can have errors up to one or two meters sometimes, and you could fix this with differential GPS or RTK, something like that. It's not really necessary for this at this point at least, but if you look at the UAV angle, you can see a little bit of drift to the left. We still have a little slide here and we never make it back directly above the pad. Mostly what I'm trying to use the GPS for is to make sure that we can keep the rocket in the middle of the field so when we go for higher flights, we can counteract any wind that might be pushing the rocket toward the side. I tried to get a few shots to track the downrange drift here. I got one shot from below that looks pretty good. Um, you can see a little bit of drift and it's a little hard with the smoke, but not too bad. I got another shot from the side that turned out to be really cool with a little bit of post-processing. So here's what I did. I brought the shot into Photoshop and then echoed the image as the vehicle goes down range and tries to correct for its position and velocity. When you overlay those echoed images, you can actually see how the correction works. We have lift off, a little bit of pitch over because of misalignment. Then at T plus one second into the flight, we begin position control and bring the vehicle back above the pad. The thing that made this flight so successful and the difference between this and flight six and seven is I implemented a Kalman filter that I wrote for AVA, which takes into account the accelerations on the vehicle. So when the GNSS radio, when the GPS is a little slow or it's a little laggy, the accelerations can fill in those gaps and make sure that we have a really good real-time estimate of our position and our velocity on the vehicle. Now we did have a little wiggle on this flight along the Z-axis, I believe, and I have a theory. On sprint flight number one, we had a significant wiggle on this same axis. I referred to it as the X-axis then, but I've changed the coordinate system since then. So the X and Z servos are identical. In fact, it's literally the same servo that has now flown twice. The servos I use have a little bit of delay, and I have it characterized pretty well so that we don't get wiggles like this anymore. In fact, that was the main problem of Sprint Flight 1, but that it returned on this flight with the system model being as good as it is at this point, and that it uses the same servo I am led to believe I think that servo may just be slow in general. We could bring out the high speed camera and we could bring out the you know, characterization stuff and really figure out how slow this servo is, but I, it's not worth it. There's a bunch of servos, they're so cheap, I'll just replace it with something better. And even if it doesn't turn out to be the servo's problem, uh, this is a thing I can fix by just dialing back the control gains a little bit. All right, so I've got Curve pulled up here with the flight data. Um, it's a great data visualization tool. It's built on Grafana, but it's really easy to dump a CSV into it and then just get some immediate plots 
of what's going on during flight. So let's take a look at that. So this is just about all of the data that Ava records during flight. Um, it's all at about 40 hertz. Um, it's actually, I've left out a couple of things. There's no uh, raw LLA here. That does get logged, but I'm not about to show that on the internet. So let's start off with the pause XIM. Pause is position. X is the uh, vector that comes out of the nose of the vehicle. Um, with our current coordinate system, so that's along the x-axis. I stands for the inertial uh, coordinate system, and then M in meters. Try to include the, the unit of measurement in most of my variables um, and data points. So this is basically our altitude. Um, you can see where the chutes deploy here. You can see a couple of different things, and we go up to just about 116 meters. Um, and then we also have it in body, although for the x-axis, it pretty much doesn't matter. Then we have our position in the y-axis, and then the position in the z-axis is somewhere here as well. Actually, you know what I can do here is why don't we overlay some stuff. So let's look at our position z, i, m, um, along with our position uh, y, i, m. I'll just drag this onto here, and then we'll shorten it to, uh, let's say, t plus 7, maybe 8 somewhere around there. And this is about the correct flight time um, for our vehicle. So you can see the total uh, position change during flight along the Y and Z axis here. Uh, the yellow is the Y axis, the green is the Z axis. Um, and you can see that once we burn out, I could also overlay the uh, acceleration on here. Why don't I do that? This is the backup IMU. There we go. We can see that the motor burns out, ah, like right around here, 5.5, almost six seconds. So let's, let's shorten it just a little bit more to where we have good control on the vehicle. I'm going to get rid of that. And then we can see that for the most part, these values are pretty well controlled during the flight. These gains are low. It's not that important to me that I stay directly above the pad. Again, mostly what we're trying to control here is the drift down range. So for most flights um, on an F10, it's not gonna be that much, especially if you're not pitching down range, maybe two to four meters maximum. But when we go on that Aerotech G11 for the next flight, or when we go on the H13 trying to get to one kilometer, those errors really stack up. So having good closed loop position control is gonna help us make sure we can get the vehicle back. Now let's look at the uh, velocities as well here. We've got velocity Y I M S and then uh, velocity Z I M S. I'm gonna overlay the Z on here. All right, here we go. And once again, um, VEL Y I M S is the velocity on the Y axis, inertial coordinate system, meters per second. Um, and same thing for the Z axis. So you can see we, we get kicked pretty hard at launch and then both of these things trend back to roughly zero. Now these aren't super smooth measurements and actually this is a great time to call out how the Kalman filter works. Um, so especially right here, you can see it gets pretty jagged. Um, especially, why don't we get a little closer here? You can see it gets pretty jagged. So we've got these prediction steps where we're predicting where the vehicle is based on accelerations. And then when you see any big jump like this or a jump here, what we're doing is we're updating the actual velocity with the GPS or the GNSS radio. Um, and so the accelerometers, if you just use them for a long time, they're gonna drift, you're gonna get a lot of error. Um, and so the Kalman filter really nicely incorporates both of those sensors. Now, let's look at the top of this uh, section of plot. And I know what you're thinking. I know you know what's coming. Let's just say it at the same time. We're gonna look at the process estimate covariances, right? Yeah? All right, let's do it. So we have all of our covariances here, and I actually, I think I did something wrong because they all look the same to me, and they shouldn't quite be that, especially the x-axis. But um, let's look at what's going on here. If I zoom in just a little bit, um, it really does look like a sawtooth wave, but it's not. It's, it's um, legitimate helpful data. The covariances help us, it, it, it tells us what the filter uh, it's hard to explain. It tells us how sure the filter is about our estimate. You can think of it as like our error probability. So as this value goes up, the filter is less and less sure 
that we are actually at the position it thinks we are, or we are actually traveling at the velocity it thinks we are. So when the, when the covariance is high, we're not really sure about where we are. When the covariance is low, we're pretty sure about it. And as you might guess, if you have some familiarity with this type of thing, what we've got going on here is GPS readings don't happen immediately, and they happen, you can actually see it here, they happen at about five hertz between T minus T plus three and T plus four. We've got one, two, three, four, almost five. I mean, it's not perfect, but um, when we have a GPS update, we can update the accuracy of our estimate, and then between GPS readings, we can sort of supplement that acceleration reading in there. So that same thing that we saw in the velocity uh, earlier in that other plot, we can see a representation of the error estimate. Um, and as the error estimate gets higher and higher, it starts to trust the GPS a little bit more. Um, anyway, that's interesting. Let's look at some other stuff. Aha, here we go. Okay, let's take a look at this. So Ava has dual IMUs. It has two separate types of IMUs. One of them is a Bosch BNO055. The other one on the back is the same unit that the Signal R2 computer uses. Um, it's a little ST microelectronics unit. Um, but if I lay over, if I overlay the Excel, uh, the primary acceleration and then the backup acceleration, we can directly compare the accuracy of these readings. This is pretty cool actually. So the yellow is the ST microelectronics. That's the less accurate sensor. And the green is the BNO055. So as I click on either one, you can see the difference in accuracy between these things. It's actually pretty close. Mostly what we're looking at is just a difference in the standard deviation or the, the regular noise of the sensor. Um, pretty cool to see this though. We also have our system state here, and this doesn't look like much, uh, but it's an indication of where our system is at uh, during flight. So if I overlay the uh, acceleration on this, it makes it a little bit clearer. So we lift off and we go from state two to state three, you can see it right there. System state three is our powered flight mode. And for that first second of flight, we're only in the orientation mode. You can see it as well in the uh, telemetry program that I wrote. You see when it says flight ORI only, we're only trying to make sure the vehicle stays upright. And we're running that integrator to make sure that we can uh, calculate the misalignment in the thrust vector control mount. Then at T plus one seconds on the dot, we go up from state three to state four, and that is position control, position and velocity control mode. We go in state four for as long as the motor burns, and then finally, when we burn out, we jump from state four to state seven. Now, why is that? Joe, why is that? Well, thanks for asking. Here's what happens. When we fly our next flight, Sprint Flight 9, we're gonna be using an Aerotech G11 motor. That burns for 14 to 16, I don't know. It's, some, it's a long time and we're gonna do a downrange pitch maneuver. Really slow, but we're gonna have the vehicle pitch downrange and try to land in the center of the field completely. This is gonna be a test of making sure that we can safely hit one kilometer. And so the states in between here, I just tell the vehicle, skip states five and skip state six, which is the downrange pitch. And so that's why we make this jump up here. When the vehicle detects that we've burned out completely, it shifts to state seven. When we detect apogee, we shift to state eight. Uh, and then if I were to zoom out just a little bit more, you can see the rest of the states here as part of the flight. Um, state eight, state nine is when the chutes get deployed. That's the chute descent mode. And then finally, um, we can't actually see when it shifts into the landing mode because at that point it starts logging the data. Um, but that's our, si our system state shifts. What else can we see here? Here's the Ori XB, which is the roll of the vehicle. Um, if we open this up, you can see a decent amount of oscillation from that roll wheel. We definitely hold it pretty close to zero, and I don't mind that we have a constant roll of about eight degrees, but the oscillation is something that can probably be fixed with just better tuning on the ground. Anyway, that's it for Sprint Flight 8. Really successful, super happy with it. Little bit of wiggle, but not something that's too hard to fix. Next up is Sprint Flight 9, once again on that Aerotech G11 motor. It's gonna burn a lot longer. It's gonna go a lot higher. We're gonna shoot for 500 meters, I don't think we'll get there. I think we might get to 400 just with drag and everything else that happens, all of the inefficiency is of flight. But that's what's coming up next. Stay tuned um, and I'm really excited. I hope we don't lose it.
Thank you so much to the patrons who support this project and thank you to you for watching, whether you have been here for a day or a minute or since 2015 when the project started, it means the world to me. And it's crazy that I get to do this stuff and somehow stay funded and just keep doing it. So um, we're about to cross 200,000 subscribers on the channel if we haven't already. And I wanted to take this opportunity to again say thank you, but also shout out some other folks who are doing stuff that is equally cool, if not cooler than me. Um, and you should go support them if you like rocketry and cool projects. T minus zero systems is uh, Rob. He's a good friend of mine and he's been building rockets for a long time. Him and I have actually been in communication for like a couple of years now, but his, his vehicles are awesome. He's building submarines now. Orion Aerospace has also had a couple great flights of their vehicles. They're working on scaling up at this point, but they're doing some great work with thrust vector control as well. Charles Roger is a dude I just found on Twitter who's been absolutely killing it. I don't know how he's moving so fast, uh, but he just had his first successful flight and it was like maybe the most stable thing I've ever seen. Higher Rocket Systems is another friend of mine. They've had a couple really good flights. They always manage it like to get it right at sunset too, so that's pretty cool. The winner of the best named rocketry program is the Goyer Space Program folks. Um, they win the award for also most beautifully filmed launches. Their vehicles are really tiny. They've had a couple great thrust vector controlled flights um, and I, I just can't emphasize enough how beautiful the shots they get are. There's a ton of other projects. I'll link a, uh, a tweet. I just asked people to list their projects. Um, I'll link that in the description down below. So if you're looking for more rocketry projects or more thrust vector controlled people to talk with, um, they're all linked down there below. There's Plenty of attention for BPS, and I so appreciate it, but I probably don't need much more. Um, so, so direct some attention to, to those projects and support them too. Um, but anyway, that's all for me for now. I'm gonna go build more stuff and try to get ready for Sprint Flight 9. Um, thanks everyone for the support. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.